In this segment, we'll continue our discussion of dynamic programming. We'll start by stating and proving the principle of optimality, which states the following. For any standard dynamic programming problem, we can write down a functional equation, and if this equation has a solution, then the solution is exactly the value function associated with that problem. And we can use this principle to compute value functions using the method of successive approximations. And we'll see exactly how this is done with the example of optimal growth. Let's start by reviewing what we mean by a standard dynamic programming problem. Let x be a metric space, and let x0 be a point in x. The problem is one of finding a sequence of points xt that maximizes the objective function shown on the slide. Here delta is a discount factor, u is the one period return function, and the transition from one point to the next in the sequence must satisfy the constraint correspondence gamma. Now assume that for any feasible plan, the limit shown on the slide exists, though we allow for the possibility that this might be infinite. Then the five tuple consisting of the metric space, the initial state, the transition correspondence, the one period return function, and the discount factor is known as a standard dynamic programming problem. And we can define a class of problems which differ only with respect to their initial state. And you notice that as you move from one state to the next, you're moving within this class of problems. And the goal is to characterize the solution to the entire class of problems. Now here's the main result we want to prove in this segment. Consider any class of standard dynamic programming problems and any bounded real function w with domain x. If w is a solution to the functional equation shown on the slide, then this class of problems has a solution, and w is precisely the value function associated with this class of problems. So let's prove this. Suppose that w is indeed a solution to the functional equation, and consider any point x in the metric space, and any feasible path xt. Now clearly the inequality shown on the slide holds, because we know that x1 is feasible starting from x, and either x1 maximizes the expression u of xy plus delta w of y, or it doesn't. If it does, then we have equality, and if it doesn't, then we have strict inequality. Either way, the weak inequality holds. Now we can apply the same reasoning to w of x1, and continue in this manner to get the expression shown on the slide. Now let t go to infinity, and you see that the first two terms in the expression go to the payoff associated with the path xt. And the last term goes to zero, because w is a bounded real function. And this means that for all feasible paths xt that start from the point x, w of x is greater than or equal to the payoff that one obtains by following xt. Now to finish the proof, we have to show that there exists a path such that this holds with equality. Because if there was no such path, then you'd have a strict inequality, and w of x would not be the supremum of attainable payoffs. Now we'll construct such a path x star t as follows. Starting from the point x, we find x1 star by maximizing the one period return plus the discounted value of w of x1 star. And by hypothesis, this is equal to w of x. And then starting from x1 star, we find x2 star in the same way, and so on, until we get the entire sequence. Now again, by repeated substitution, we find that w of x is equal to the discounted sum of one period returns, plus the discounted value of w evaluated at x star t plus one. Now again, let t go to infinity, recall that w is bounded, and we see that w of x is precisely the payoff we obtain from the feasible path x star t if we start at x. And this has to be greater than the payoff obtained from any other feasible path, as we showed a moment ago, which means that w of x is precisely the supremum of the set of payoffs that are feasible when you start at x. And in fact, w of x is attainable if we follow x star t, so x star t is a solution to the dynamic programming problem. Now let's see how this can be used to compute value functions. And we'll do this by going back to the example of optimal growth, which you've seen earlier. Suppose that capital at the start of period t is xt, output, including depreciated capital, is f of xt, and consumption in period t is ct. So capital at the start of the next period is today's output minus consumption. Given some initial level of capital, x0, non-negative, the problem is to choose a path, xt, to maximize the sum of discounted utilities from consumption. And this is subject to the constraint that the capital you leave for the following period can't exceed the output of the current period. Now given some one period return function u and some discount factor delta, this is a standard dynamic programming problem where the metric space is a subset of the real numbers and the transition correspondence just requires that the capital tomorrow must be somewhere between zero and the total output today. Let's take a particular numerical specification of this example. Suppose that the metric space consists of the closed unit interval. Some initial level of capital x0 is given. The output you get from capital x is simply the square root of x. 
The one period return is the log function and the discount factor is one half. Now the value function must be a solution to the equation shown on the slide. And we can find the value function using the method of successive approximations as follows. So let's start off with an initial guess. In fact, we can use a very crude guess that the value function is identically zero everywhere. So if you plug in this initial guess into the right hand side of the equation shown and solve the maximization problem, you get a new candidate value function w1 of x, which is just a half log x. Now this makes total sense. A half log x is just the log of the square root of x. And that's the payoff you would get if you consumed everything today and left nothing for tomorrow. And if it were indeed true that the value function was zero, so there's no value to leaving anything for tomorrow, then you want to consume everything today and this is the payoff that you would get. Now of course this is not the value function because this is not a solution to the functional equation. But we can take w1 of x as our next starting point and apply the same reasoning to find w2 of x. Now if you do that you can verify that w2 of x will be given by the expression on the slide. And if you iterate further you'll see that all the value functions you're obtaining have the form alpha log x plus beta where alpha and beta are parameters. Now this suggests that the limit of this sequence of approximations will also have this form. And if we use this conjecture, we just need to find two parameters, alpha and beta, that allow us to solve the functional equation. And if you do that, you indeed find a function that is a fixed point of the functional equation, and that corresponds to the value function we were looking for by the principle of optimality. Now let's consider the optimal policy correspondence, which we defined in the previous segment. And we find that in this case, it's single valued, so we have an optimal policy function. Given the level of capital x at the start of the current period, our output will be the square root of x, and we want to leave one-fourth of this for the next period and consume three-quarters of it today. Now you should verify that at the optimal solution, the equation shown on the slide is satisfied. And this holds generally in one-sector optimal growth models and has a very natural economic interpretation. On the left-hand side, we have the utility loss that you would experience if you cut your consumption today by a small amount and transferred it to the next period. And the right-hand side tells you the discounted value of the utility gain that you experience if you consume the extra production that would result from this transfer of resources from the current period to the next. Now it's very natural that this should be a necessary condition for optimality because if it didn't hold, then you could increase your payoff by transferring resources across time, either from today to tomorrow or the reverse. Now to finish up, let's consider steady states. So a steady state x star is a level of capital that is unchanging from one period to the next under an optimal path. And we can obtain this by looking for a fixed point of the optimal policy correspondence. And in this example, we find that a steady state arises at x star equal to 1 16th. And this is the only non-zero steady state. There's clearly a steady state at x star equal to 0, but that's because the only feasible path from x star equal to 0 is in fact 0. Now you should check that the slope of the production function at the steady state is the reciprocal of the discount factor. And again, this is something that holds more generally, and we'll discuss further in the next segment. I'll stop there for now.